good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, coming to you from the studios at the Coming Home Network International. And this is the first <clears throat> of a, a special series of programs that we've been discussing recently in which I've invited my good friend and, and co-worker uh, Ken Hensley to join me as a co-teacher of the book of James. And so I'm not sure how long it'll take. Hopefully it'll, it'll uh, who knows, it may, maybe Jesus will come before we finish the book, you know, but we'll find out. But I am, what's unique about this program, if you will, is I'm coming to you from Ohio, the heart of it all. And Ken is coming from California, the left of us all. Of us all. <laughs> Hello, Ken. How are you doing? I'm doing great. This is exciting. This is going to be fun. Well, it's, you know, first of all. As we try and figure out how to have two preachers teach through the book of James at the same time. Yeah. Great. Actually, I was trying to envision this as if <laughs> you and I, Ken, were in front of a class of people, how we would divvy this up because we— we both have similar backgrounds, both seminary backgrounds, pastoral work, and both, you know, have come into the church, Catholic Church, and and I hope you audience enjoy this. We look forward for any of your comments. You can, uh, if you have any questions, the easiest way can really is for them to get involved in the community, right? Yeah, we're going to be posting these in the community, um, in the online community, CHN online community, where you could watch, um, where you could ask questions make comments, and some some of your questions we will bring up at the next show and uh, talk to them, I mean, talk about them in the show, but that's the best way to stay in touch. I'd like to say one more thing quickly, too. As we're teaching through the book, we're going to end up rattling off a lot of passages of Scripture or maybe just may, making reference to them and moving along because we won't have time to stop and look up each one, but just remember that you can pause the video when you're watching it and you can look up each passage and read it, and I encourage you to do that, or at least write them down to look uh, look look at them later. So, it anyway, is it's great house cleaning. I, I agree with that. You know, some might ask, well, why do a Bible study of the book of James uh, on the one hand compared to other scriptures, or other books, or or why even do one? And I've been a, a Christian for a, a fair number of years, and one of the things I've kind of recognize is that one of the strategies of the devil, he has a, a series of strategies, it seems, in history, and he tries to stop something if the Lord has initiated something. And so he, the devil tries to stop it, and then if the devil can't stop it, he tries to ridicule it or undercut it or copy it or twist it whatever it is. And then if that doesn't work, he fills the world full of counterfeits. He, he floods the market. And I'll give example of that. You know, the Lord establishes a church. The devil tries to stop it. When that didn't work, then ridicule, attack, confusion, everything mm -hmm. imagined. And, and then when that didn't stop the church, well, he floods the market. To the point where here we are today, 30 or more thousand different Christian traditions in the world, which one's right? And what happens is yeah. it, it paralyzes people to even want to be in a church because there are so many. Where do I start? And and that's true with the Bible. Which Bible? And then even when you take the time to look at a wonderful book like the book of James— you go online and you'll find dozens of commentaries over the centuries, different opinions all over the place. You can find, and, and so it, it the, the market becomes so flooded that it discourages you to even try. Mm -hmm. But we don't want, as James and Peter will both say, you don't want the devil to stop you from studying the Word of God. And that's why we want to do this. We, we, we want to take the time. Both Ken and I have had the, the great privilege of having seminary education, of having studied the original language. We've had the great, great privilege of serving as pastors, and we love the Word of God. And so we look to this opportunity as a fun time. 
We're not coming yeah. on this program as two scholars, academics who want to uh, give lectures. We're really just two old former pastors that love the Word of God, love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to talk about this wonderful book. Isn't that right, Ken? That's exactly right. Yeah. I taught through the book of James when I was a youth pastor. I preached through the book of James when I was a pastor. And um, it's one of the things that I've missed since leaving the Protestant ministry, you know, 23 years ago now, was the, you know, the opportunity to be in Scripture more and to teach more. So this is this is great. Yeah. And I'll, uh, all of you listening, especially those of you that stick with us through this long study, uh, when I say long, it, it probably will take several months at least uh, to get through this short book. But um, the, one of the frustrating things, Ken, I don't know if you found it, when I preached through books when it, back when I was a pastor, like when I, I remember when I preached through Ephesians, it took more than six months of Sundays to mm-hmm. preach through Ephesians, maybe a year. It's been years ago. But I found that by the time I had worked through all that and I got to the end, I found myself wishing I could start over again because I started to realize that I understood the earlier verses in the book better once yeah, I had worked through yeah. to the end. So yeah. I'm sure we'll find that way with this great book of James. Uh, uh, before we jump into it, to this today's excuse me today's program is going to be an introduction. We're going to look at some of the basic uh, overall themes of the book. Look the author when it's believed it was written. Who was he writing mm-hmm. to? Why did he write the book? That's what we're going to look at today. And before we jump in, for those of you that are anxious to do us the study along with us. There's a number of commentaries that we we recommend that they seem very balanced. There's a bazillion out there that are all over the place that have uh, they're, they're looking through different lenses, sometimes lenses that I wouldn't consider trustworthy. But a number of commentaries that I strongly recommend, one of which is the Navarre Study Bible, and the volume is called the Catholic Epistles. And this is a, a, a wonderful commentary, to, very easy to follow. Another one that I like personally is called the Catholic Commentary on Holy Scripture, Volume 2 on the New Testament. This was printed in the 1950s. It's been reprinted um, by Dave Armstrong and a number of folk. Well, that's not Dave Armstrong, but the, excuse me, but... Um, been republished by Thomas Nelson. This was put together in the 1950s by a number of Catholic, English, British scholars. And Ken, do you do you have any you want to add to that list of commentaries? Well, I would just recommend? add this: the the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible is a very good New Testament. This is just the New Testament. Yep. You can see it's quite thick. Um, it's got very good introductions and very good critical notes. And it's written, I mean, it's edited by a staff of Catholic scholars and is very, very good. So this is a New Testament Bible that I often use um, as a study Bible. Okay. Excellent. Those are all very good. Now, the other thing that we, as we begin, um, as Ken started out with and, and suggested, we're not going to quote every reference that we mentioned just because of time. But on top of that, we aren't going to have the time to discuss every doctrinal, theological, historical controversy that may be associated with one of the scriptures. We'll we'll probably allude to it and and probably talk a a bit Mm -hmm. about it, but uh, we just won't have the time. So again, we may give you references on your own to look at. And if you have any specific questions, you join that online community and let us know. Okay, let's jump right into it, Ken. This wonderful book of James, um, it's found in the New Testament right after the book of Hebrews. For those of you that aren't it's still struggling to find your way around there, just a couple of introductory ideas then before we jump into who was the author of this book. And the first assumption that I need to pass along is to let you know that the way we are approaching our Bible study is not through the lens of sola scriptura. And I believe it's important to mention that because 
in the world in which we live, in the soup in which all of us have lived all of our lives, regardless how old you are, the majority of Bible studies that are done in local churches are done through the assumption of sola scriptura, whether you know it or not. And it often is expressed in the idea that, okay, here we're going to look at the book of James, and we're going to, almost like a clean slate, we'll put aside everything we think we've known about it, and we're just going to look at just that book and hear what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. Now, I can't deny that the Holy Spirit can use that. I know it did in my own life back 40 years ago when I came to Jesus Christ. But it also can lead to great confusion because it denies the work of the Holy Spirit of the last 2,000 years. And it denies the promise that our Lord Jesus gave to his apostles when he promised that he would give them Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. So in other words, and Ken, I'll, I'll, I'll say one more comment, then I'll, I'll pass it over to you. A good example of that is I remember I used to lead Bible studies on, okay, what's, what does baptism mean? And we would say, okay, let's, let's look up in the Bible all the verses that use the word baptism, and then from those verses we'll discover what baptism means. And then I discovered that that's actually the opposite way to go. That, in fact, we recognize that the Holy Spirit given by our Lord to his apostles that has established the apostolic succession, that has preserved the deposit of faith that the apostles Mm -hmm. received from Jesus, Mm -hmm. that forms the foundation for the tradition of the church, has established what baptism means. We don't Mm -hmm. have to rediscover we ourselves may need to rediscover baptism, but baptism doesn't need to be rediscovered. The church, guided by the Holy Spirit, has established what baptism means. So given that understanding of baptism, we can then go to Scripture and look at those verses that use the word baptism to understand what they mean in Scripture, mm-hmm. given what we already know about baptism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I would only say that I think that that's a, a a very good illustration. When I um when I studied baptism just in the New Testament, I came away with the feeling that I could go two or three different directions with it. It wasn't absolutely clear to me uh, um, what what baptism meant. But when I read the early church fathers and I read good historical works on the early church fathers, then you see a very clear doctrine that developed, as you say, through the succession of the apostles, the tradition of the early church led by the Holy Spirit. There's a clear doctrine of baptism, and that doctrine is held, well, J.N.D. Kelly, the great Anglican scholar and historian, he says that that doctrine was basically unchallenged all the way up to the Reformation. So once I saw that doctrine, and then I went back and read the New Testament through the lens of that tradition, or the early church doctrine, then it became much more clear what the New Testament was actually saying. So I just second what you're saying. We're not going to look at, um, with the assumption of sola scriptura, but take into account the the tradition of the early church and the decisions of magisterium along the way. Yeah, great example. This is why we brought this up, is the very first verse of James, which is James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. That's the opening (laughs) verse. Yeah, and if you want to go pure sola scriptura, then you and I have got to stop and figure out what Lord means and what God means throughout the New Testament, uh, what Jesus Christ means throughout the whole New Testament. If if you read the history of the church of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries in detail, you realize that there were bishops and theologians and priests and the, the, uh, you know, at each other's throats, trying to understand the relationship between God the Father mm-hmm. and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the whole Arian controversy, which at almost by the end, uh, 
of the fourth century, I think it was Jerome that said the church had had woken up and found itself Arian because a vast majority of people saw in this very verse that there's a God and then there's this man who has been made Lord mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. through his obedience. So, mm-hmm. and my only point for bringing this up, and, and Ken, you, you emphasized it well, is that we're not going to spend the whole time trying to get in that controversy, but we recognize that they're in the Trinity. We're beginning with the understanding mm-hmm. that there is one God in three persons that's been defined by the Holy Spirit in the church, so we don't have to discover that from scratch. Right, and right. our point being that, so we approach the scriptures through the eyes of the church. And uh, and so that's how we approach, mm-hmm. and that's how we mm-hmm. recommend approach. Now, the second thing is, and this brings out another thing, is on, I've decided to pose to my good buddy here out in the left coast what his what he thinks is the key verse of James. And I've brought what I think are the key is the key verse, and I don't know that we've picked up the same verse. And I want to point out to the audience that that's another reason why two different people coming to the same book can sometimes come from different conclusions. So, Ken, let me ask you. Oh, me first, huh? I'm doing you first. Okay. What do you All think right. is, from your well, perspective, you think is the key verse? Well, I, I may be, I may be uh, twisting your meaning ever so slightly. So here you go already, looking through different lenses. But I wanted mine to be slightly humorous in a way. So I don't know if this is the key. I don't know if this really is the key verse in James, but it's a key verse for me as a convert. And it's James 2, verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay. And the reason I picked that verse is that, you know, famously, Martin Luther, when he was translating the New Testament into German, he famously added the word alone to the Greek text uh, or to the text of um, Romans 3.28, where Paul says we are justified, a man is justified by faith, not by works of the law. He, he added the word alone. A man is justified by faith alone. And thus the, the, the Reformation doctrine of sola fide or justification by faith alone. And this is a passage in James that just gave Luther fits yeah. because here he just states, you know, the funny thing, this is the humorous thing, is that the only time that the that the phrase faith alone actually occurs in the New Testament, it's in a verse that says we are ju- not justified. <laughs> we are yeah. not justified by faith alone. Anyway, it was a, a verse like that and others in James that, that led Luther to call James an epistle of straw and to say, you know, that, that James is so clearly contradicting St. Paul in teaching justification by works, and he even said at one point, "I wish I could take Jimmy and throw him into the stove, yeah. just burn him up." So anyway, well, I don't want to. I don't intend right now to reconcile that with Paul and to explain what he means or anything like that. But just to bring it up as a verse that stands out to me as as sort of a key verse in James. Well, my good brother out on the on the California West or <laughs> West Coast, you uh-huh. know, in in all sincerity, uh, I think you're absolutely dead wrong. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm just joking. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the key verse, and it, but well, you point out a great, you really do point out a great thing, and that is that because of the Reformation, uh, a great majority of people think that the key issue in Christian faith is how do you understand justification, mm-hmm. and, and and the truth is. <clears throat> That was only a major theme in the last 500 years. For the first 1,500 years, mm-hmm. it's not that it wasn't mentioned, but it wasn't the main theme. And so right. I agree with what, you know, in terms of a, a yeah. verse of James that is important to us because of our our spiritual journeys, that's a key issue. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, and so that's also a reason why, and we'll get to it later, many people thought James w- was written later because they thought that that was the issue. Remember, they they thought that the reason yeah, for the book yeah. of James was, was to combat Paul. We'll get into that a little bit more. Yeah. The first I've chosen, which uh, you know is a little bit tongue in cheek in terms of the main thing, but I think it's an important verse. And maybe for me, I see it as the theme of James, and that's 
chapter 5, verse 8. And with James, the, the, the verse pulled out of its context says, You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. And the reason, if you go back to the verse before, be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit mm-hmm. of the earth, being patient over it mm-hmm. until it receives early in the late rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. The reason I, I pull that out is because this is an aspect of the entire New Testament that I think people <coughs> forget, and that is all of the authors of the New Testament, as well as our Lord Jesus, were very conscious of the of the anticipation of the return of our lord and living their lives always mm-hmm. in patient waiting and watching and the urgency of that the importance of that and you find it in every book and and it's in james mm-hmm. and so the idea again again, Catholic teaching is that we are now living in the age of Christ's lordship. The kingdom of God (coughs) is now. And the the simple statement of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord. And that, as we say every time we recite the creed, we believe he's coming again. And he's, as our Lord himself said, like, like Noah, people are living their lives like it's never going to happen, and all of us are doing that, but he can come like a thief in the night. So I think that that urgency was very important to James, and it was that urgency that fed why he was so uh, exhortive about what he was saying. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I think that's an important part of James, why he felt the need to write mm-hmm. the letter. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the, the Christians who had been dispersed were out like, how do you say it, Kenyon? Like, like when you pull coals out of a fire, right? You know, when you have a fire and you pull coals out of the mm-hmm. fire and those coals embers have a, the danger of that's who he's writing to. Mm-hmm. And there's an urgency because mm-hmm. they believe they believe Christ was coming soon. And our problem is that because we've thought about it for two thousand years, we don't think he's going to ever come again. You know, and say, like, mm-hmm. eh, I don't know. I think right time the time we're living now is is uh, uh, very reminiscent of the kind of time <clears throat> that James was writing. So, with those assumptions, I think there's an urgency. I think, as you said, it's, this has been a controversial book throughout history because of the issue of justification mm-hmm. and, and other things, and we're looking at it within the uh, the umbrella of of tradition. Just again, a couple things, Ken. I would say the overall theme of this book is that it's this interaction between our faith and our life. Mm-hmm. It isn't faith alone. Nor is it just our works alone. It's not merely our externals, but they, they're like hand and glove, and they need to be hand and glove. Um, the book seems to deal more with moral issues than doctrinal. Mm-hmm. And so the point there is that we got to be careful uh, when, we, when those want to only look at the doctrinal issues, mm-hmm. and that really wasn't James's concern. He was urgently concerned about the lives of these people. The letter is very pastoral. It's You have to see it as if it's a bishop caring for his people who have been dispersed, and he's concerned about their lives. And maybe just two other quick things, and that is, number one, what you see in this is the very vital, spontaneous exposition given to the Christian message in the first communities. I mean, mm-hmm. they're on fire for their faith. James is. He's, he's concerned that some people aren't. So he, 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 keep it alive is what it's about. Keep this message mm-hmm. alive 
And the other thing is that the book of James points out this unity between the Old Testament and the New. It's not that now that we have a church, the old doesn't matter anymore. It's a both hand. It's a you know, James makes all kinds of references to Old Testament characters and situations. Yeah, very much so, very much so. Well, we're going to get into all these things again and again in talking about the character of the book and the themes as they come up. Um, <clears throat> how about if I dive into talking about the authorship real quick? I'll see if I can whack this off in about five minutes because we've already used quite a bit of time. Um, the authorship of the book, James is a common name in Hebrew, very common name, and so that doesn't tell us much. In fact, when we look into the New Testament, we find that there are at least two important figures named James, maybe three, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'll run through them quickly. First of all, when we read the Gospels and we read the lists of the apostles, we run immediately into two of them. There's, there's James, the, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, the fisherman. And then there's someone called James, the son of Alphaeus. So there are two right there in the 12. But then there is another James, at least could be another James, that is mentioned in the Gospels and referred to as the brother of Jesus. This is in Matthew 13, 55, but there are other passages as well. They refer to James the brother of Jesus, and James had a brother named Joseph, and Simon, and uh, Judas, and they're referred to as brothers of Jesus. Although, and I don't want to try and get at this point, as you said, I, I don't want to go off into trying to talk about perpetual virginity and uh, Mary, you know, whether Jesus had physical brothers. We don't believe that he did. In fact, by looking at several verses, John, uh, just write these down, those who are listen, listening, John 19, 25, and then Matthew 27, 56, and 61, we can, uh, so that's John 19, 25, and Matthew 27, 56, and 61. It appears that this Jesus, I mean, this James, the brother of our Lord, and the brother of Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, is the son of Mary, another Mary, Mary, the, the wife of Cleopas. And so at the cross, you have several Marys. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have Mary Magdalene. We have Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And these seem to be the sons of Mary, the wife of Cleopas. So, but, but the reason that I say that there are at least two is that through the history of the church, there's been a debate, Marcus, where some have said, well, there are three James in the New Testament, James the Greater, that's James the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, James the Lesser, or James the Less, that's James the son of Alphaeus, and then another James who's referred to as James the Lord's brother, and so there would be three. But then many have argued, in fact, Jerome was one of them that argued, that James the brother of Jesus is the same person as James the son of Alphaeus, so this James is James the less. And I know that you have an opinion on that too. And you, um, isn't that basically the, the standard position of the Western church? Yeah. Didn't that, you say that? Well, again, there's this, you, you know, that um, it, nowadays you can distinguish two people named Marcus because you know their middle names, you know their last <laughs> names. You, you know, in those days yeah. we got James, you know, and you know, the, the son of somebody. And and, uh, and it seems to me, Ken, yeah, you had different opinions in the early church. But, and I, I might pass this back yeah. to you, but when, we, when you take a step back and you ask, okay, how do we approach it maybe from the another angle to say, from our standpoint, what really is most important and yeah, the, and that's what I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's yeah. really the most important thing, because we have all this data, and mm -hmm. as I was saying before, the devil mm -hmm. can get us so wound up in that stuff that right. we start to doubt that this is the inspired Word of God. But I think there's good reason to believe yeah. that this James was a very trusted man in the early church. Yeah, what it boils down to is that, from what I understand, is that in the Eastern church, there was a tendency to see three James and in the Western church, there was more of a tendency to see them as being two. That James, the son of Alphaeus, the apostle, is the same person as this one who is referred to as James, the brother of our Lord. Um, but the important thing, as you say, is this. The important thing is that the evidence strongly suggests 
that this James, this James the Lesser, or James the Brother of our Lord, is the James that authored this New Testament epistle of James that we're looking at, okay? First of all, James, the the brother or the son of Zebedee and the brother of John, he was martyred very early in the church. It's, it, it occurs in Acts chapter 12, where Herod um, Agrippa I puts James to death um, by the sword. And this occurred, we know, because Herod Agrippa I ruled uh, between 41 and 44 AD. So this happened very early, sometime between 41 and 44 AD. And so it doesn't seem that he would be the author of this letter. On the other hand, there are just piles of evidence in favor of the other John, I mean, the other James, James the Lesser, we refer to him, and later he was referred to as James the Just. And let me just sort of rattle off some of these reasons and you can jump in, you can cut in, comment on it along the way. Um, first of all, this James is referred to as being a near kinsman of Jesus himself. We know that. The word brother, Adelphos in mm-hmm. the Greek, could refer to a brother, a physical brother, or a cousin, a near kinsman of some kind. Uh, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this James was a witness to the resurrection. Mm-hmm. He says Jesus appeared to the twelve. And he appeared to James as well, and then appeared to him, Paul. Um, This James became the leader of the Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem. We know that um, because after James the Greater was martyred, Herod Agrippa came after Peter. Peter was thrown into prison. This is all in Acts chapter 12. Peter miraculously escapes prison, but because Herod's on his heels now... (laughs) Peter is going to leave Jerusalem and he's going to head off on his travels. And one of the last things he says to the people is he says, tell this to James and to the brethren, tell this to James. So it it seems really clear, Marcus, that, that from the moment that, um, that, that James the greater was martyred, James the lesser, this James, the brother of our Lord began to be looked at as the leader of the Jewish Christian community of the church in Jerusalem. So that when Peter's leaving, he says, tell this to James and to the brethren. We go forward to the book of Acts a little bit in Acts chapter 15, when the very first council of the Christian church um, takes place, the council of Jerusalem, we find if we read Acts 15 through that James appears to be sort of the host of this council um, or the leader in the church there in Jerusalem. Um, In his letter to the Galatians, I'm just piling up more of these reasons. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul reports that at his very first trip to Jerusalem after his own conversion, he met only with Cephas, Peter, and with James, who he refers to as the brother of our Lord. And then Paul says, this is in Galatians chapter 2, that when he and Barnabas came back to Jerusalem around the time of the Jerusalem council, this is what he says. He says, Quote, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. That's Galatians 2, verses 9 and 12. Now, this is occurring some years after uh, James the Greater was martyred. Um, He was martyred in 41 to 44. The Jerusalem Council is probably 49 AD, maybe 50 AD, probably, most probably 49. And so Paul is saying at this point, when he came to town, he lists James, Cephas, and John as being the pillars of the church who received him and Barnabas and gave them the right hand of fellowship, that they should go to the Gentiles while um, James and Cephas and John would focus on the circumcised or the Jewish believers. And then there's just a little bit more. In Acts 21, we read how Luke and Paul, this is Acts 21, verse 18, how Luke and Paul, when they came to Jerusalem again later on, they go to visit, quote, James and all the elders. So so again, implying that James is the leader. You, You put all this together. James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And this is a Jewish, it is a church primarily of Jewish Christians, which is going to be important because we see the book of James is all is very Jewish in its flavor and it's written to Jewish believers as well. So it all adds up and tradition has it that James was the first bishop of Jerusalem. The majority of the early church fathers took this position that this James 
the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was the author of the epistle to James, of the epistle of James, including Clement, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, Eusebius, the Council of Laodicea, which was held in 360. All of this fits. And then the last point that I want to make is that the time frame fits as well, because this James was martyred around 62 AD, so that gives plenty of time. That's the same decade in which Paul and Peter were both martyred as well in Rome. He was martyred, um, ver various sources, I mean, he, he was martyred by the high priest Annas II. Various sources say that he was either stoned to death or he was clubbed to death. Or Eusebius in his in his famous church history um, says that he was thrown off the top of the of the pinnacle of the temple and then still alive after he hit, he was um, stoned or beaten with clubs or something. But the time frame fits. And then finally, James as a man, I think, and we're gonna see this, fits. This James came to be referred to as James the Just. Mm. And he was also called James uh, Camel Knees or J uh, James the Man with Camel Knees because they said he was so holy and he prayed so much that his knees looked like the knees of a camel. And as we read through James, we're going to see that we, we, we definitely have a, a holy man here who is exhorting these. Um, he has the authority to exhort them, so it fits that he's the ruler or the bishop in the church in Jerusalem. And, and I would say that the traditional position then is the position that makes sense. Yeah. And thanks, Ken. That was awesome. I, I agree with that. You know, envision this then with what Ken has just summarized. <clears throat> as far as we know, our Lord was crucified around the year 30 AD. Yeah. Crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, Pentecost about 30 A.D. So we're talking now between that time and the martyrdom of the first James, which is about 14 years later, 15 years later, mm -hmm. right, Ken? Or, or less, because it, it could be between 41 and 44. So uh, if you will think <clears throat> about, folk, you know, the resurrection, the, the ascension, Pentecost, the, the early preaching of Peter, the, the formation of the early communities, the spreading out, 5,000 converted, 3,000. It's really the mm -hmm. work of grace as people's hearts. And what we have are these men that were chosen by our Lord Jesus uh, and empowered by the Spirit to be the leaders. And so the communities are recognizing their authority. And so as soon as the first James, the brother of John, is martyred, almost miss immediately what we assume is happening is that the people <clears throat> recognize this authority of, of James the Lesser. And mm -hmm. it's interesting, James the Lesser, almost implying the more humble. And so that's around the mid-40s. And then five years later, we have the Jerusalem Council, which uh, is crucial in the entire mm -hmm. history of the church, uh, which we'll, I'm going to talk about in just a little bit, around 50, let's say, 49 or 50. Mm -hmm. And then 12 years after that, this James is martyred. And that's only 32 years between mm -hmm. the resurrection of mm -hmm. our Lord and the martyrdom of James. Think of our lives, 30 years. It, it, lots happened in our lives in 30 years. We don't have a lot of data. So I want to talk a bit about the date of when this letter mm -hmm. was written in there. You know, the the, the you know, <clears throat> majority of patristic scholars and then the majority of conservative, com conservative commentators, Protestant or Catholic for the last 2,000 years, mm -hmm. recognize it's this man we're talking about that wrote this letter. Mm -hmm. The question is, when did he write it in that time period? Between likely, he would have written it sometime between, let's say, 44, when the time he became bishop, and the time he was martyred in the year 62. So when did he write it in, in that time period? Uh, there's about... 15, 16 years in there. When did he write it in there? And 
you may wonder, well, what difference does that make? Well, actually, there's a very, very unique thing that that helps us understand the whole book mm-hmm. of James. And let me back up and just say that, you know, there's when do when were any of the books of the New Testament written? And there's a lot of pressure on scholars to to push the dating and the writing of the books as late in the first century as possible. And the reason behind this, this is my opinion, the reason behind that is because so many scholars want to push the writing of the books later in the first century so they can imply that as the church developed, the church influenced what was in the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that particularly came about through anti-Catholic scholars that wanted to make sure that Matthew 16 was added later rather yeah, that than it wasn't talking that it wasn't something Jesus had actually said to Peter. Right. Right. Yeah. When I was in college and I took a yeah. course on this back in the late early seventies, my teacher said that there were actually only four things that Jesus said that we can be sure that he said everything else we don't know. I mean, that's baloney. Excuse me. Yeah. And then you've got new Testament scholars like, uh, Bart Ehrman, who, who is basically an atheist. And he wants to push the dates out really far so that he can imply that the, that the information was all just passed along word of mouth and it w- may not be very very re- reliable and whatnot. But anyway, yeah, and there's a group ahead. of yes, I follow you. There's a group of people that want to say all these things were written sometime in the middle of the first century, all created by some Roman leadership that wanted to come up with a new religion to control their people. I mean, so there's all kinds of theories yeah. out there, and the devil laughs. The devil laughs, but. Two things, two important dates that you've got to realize were so mind-numbing to the early Jewish Christians particularly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that there's, there's no way to believe that they wouldn't have referenced them in any of these books if these books were written after these two events. Mm-hmm. And the first is the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, because so many Old Testament prophets, the the very words of our Lord Jesus that said that the the walls of this temple will be thrown down, and one Mm -hmm. of the reasons he was convicted and crucified is because he had the audacity to say that this Mm -hmm. temple would fall, that if any of the books were written after that, in fact, happened in 70 A.D., there's no way they wouldn't have mentioned it, which is strong reason mm-hmm. to argue that every single New Testament book was written before the fall of Jerusalem, which mm-hmm. is what I believe. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. All of Paul's letters obviously were written before that. Peter, because he was martyred in the 60s. James was martyred in 62, so it had to be before. So at least in terms of this book, it makes sense that it was written before Mm -hmm. the fall of Jerusalem. But there's another event that's so absolutely key, and that is the Jerusalem Council that we read about in Acts chapter 15, in which, we won't go into the whole story now, but the, the main issue was that up until the Jerusalem Council, and up until specifically when Peter had his dream Mm -hmm. in which he is told by the Holy Spirit to go and baptize this Gentile without circumcising him. That was Mm -hmm. a a world-changing awakening that from now on, Christian converts, whether especially Jewish Christian converts, did not have to become Jews first. They did not have to be circumcised that they could just accept Jesus as their Lord and then be baptized. Mm -hmm. And that was so life-changing in in their lives that they had to form a council to decide what to do. And Mm -hmm. the man in charge of that council was James. Mm -hmm. And uh, just another thing to add, Ken, that a lot of non-Catholics will say, well, why, why wasn't Peter in charge? I thought he was the Pope. Why wasn't he in charge? Well, it's it's important to recognize that it, that Paul says in Ephesians 4 that his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And the basic idea is that 
the apostles, the hand-chosen apostles, were not specifically chosen to be bishops. They were more specifically Mm -hmm. chosen to go out to be missionaries. They would spend their times in their Mm -hmm. communities that they started, but generally, once the community got started, they would appoint new men to be the bishops, and they would go on and start another church. And we see that modeled in Paul, and then we hear it about the others, like Mark and James. And you know, and this makes sense with Peter because Peter is in Jerusalem, and it's very clear from the early chapters of Acts that Peter is um, a very much a leader in Jerusalem. It's Peter and John that go into the temple, that perform the miracles. Uh, there are all these things that could be listed. But it makes sense that Peter would be establishing someone else to run the church, especially when he's preparing to leave. And when he leaves again, you know, as we read in Acts chapter 12, when he leaves and he says, tell James and the others, you know, and he leaves on his journeys, it it, it makes sense. So he leaves James in charge of the church so that when the council comes up years later, um, even though Peter's there and Paul is there, James is functioning as the bishop. Yeah, go ahead. He's the local pastor. Right. You know, we we look at our bishops today and they're in their and their regalia and their big chairs and their big mansions, you know, excuse me for my cynicism, but that's not how the bishops were in the early church. They were like our pastors, if you will. They were right. far more like our local pastor running a local church. That was James. And the fact that James doesn't mention anything about the <laughs> circumcision issue, um, He doesn't mention any of those things that we see in Paul's writings that come out in Galatians and Romans. It's a strong argument that James was written before the Jerusalem Council. And he's primarily writing in the the target audience he's thinking of are Mm -hmm. primarily Jewish Christians. Because the assumption at this point is any Gentile that by grace awakens to Christ, they have to be circumcised first, essentially to become a Jewish Christian, was the Mm -hmm. assumption behind this letter. So all that to say, so when did this happen? So my argument is that that there's really two groups of people. Some There are some commentators that want to argue it's later, and that the purpose of it was because Paul had written Galatians and Romans, and James didn't like the doctrinal emphasis on faith alone, quote, faith alone, mm-hmm. quote, and uh, you can talk about that later, Ken. But so he had to emphasize no faith apart from works mm-hmm. is dead. On the other hand, I believe that this letter written before the council, before Paul mm-hmm. even wrote his letters, actually before mm-hmm. Paul himself had awakening to this very issue, that what James is dealing with are Jewish converts to the Christian faith, as well as any Gentile God-fearers that became Jews Mm -hmm. and now are Christians. And Mm -hmm. part of their problem is this. Think about all that our Lord taught his Jewish audience, and you recognize that the, the basic Jewish audience to whom Jesus was speaking had already become lax in their Jewish faith because mm-hmm. they were following their Pharisees who, were, as Luke says, were more interested in money than in holiness. Mm-hmm. And so that had communicated to the people, and that's exactly why Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount to inspire the Jews to rediscover and reclaim their faith. So when these Jews were converted to Christianity, mm-hmm. they needed to almost rediscover their faith all over again. Mm-hmm. And, and the danger was that these nominal Jews who became Christians could either become libertines, meaning, wow, mm-hmm. there's great freedom in Jesus. I don't need the law anymore. I can do anything I want to do. And so they would need to be excited about the faith as well as relearning their obedience. Mm -hmm. The other group are the legalists. They left one legal religion, and they're so accustomed to that that they become Christians, and now they want to be legal all Mm -hmm. over again. So So James, as well as Paul, try to strike a balance with the communities to which they're writing. Yes, you yes, yes. In, in fact, I, I, I guess this, this segues very well into the issue of who's he writing to. Yep. And and you just said it. So let me kind of repeat what you said in my own words. 
I mean, he says here, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Okay, the, the, the Jews that had been scattered throughout the, 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 Roman, the Greco-Roman world for, well, really since the Babylonian captivity 500 years before, were referred to as the diaspora. They were Jews that were living outside the land and scattered all over again, the, the first the Greek world and then the Roman world. And when we come to the book of Acts, Peter stands up and preaches, and it's on the day of Pentecost. And we read in Acts that Jews had flocked into Jerusalem for the festival, and they had come from all of these places. I don't want to turn there now, but maybe you remember from Pontus and Galatia and you know, um, Cilicia, from all over the place. I mean, if you find the passage and you want to cut in and read it, you can. Um, Schenectady. So, yeah, from Schenectady? Yeah. <laughs> anybody from anybody from Zanesville or Columbus or, or where I live in Southern California? Sure. Anyway, Jews from all over the diaspora had flocked into Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and they're the ones that heard James preaching, and they're the ones that thought the apostles were drunk when they were speaking to them in tongues, right? And they said, who are these guys? They're drunk. Because he said, we hear them speaking in all of our languages. So point is, Jews from the diaspora are all crowded into Jerusalem, and they hear the message. And on that very day, 3,000 are converted and are baptized. Well, they leave Jerusalem, and they go back to their homes, very little catechized. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, think about it. There are no established churches where they go home. There are no bishops. There, there's, there's nothing there are no, there's no New Testament scriptures, but they go home. And then on top of that, when the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8 describes it, it says that many of them were, um, were dispersed and fled out from there to escape the persecution. So I think that what you're saying about the timing of James is right on. James is the leader of the Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem. His focus is on the circumcision, on the ministry to the Jews, evangelism to the Jews. And he's writing to Jewish Christians that are scattered all over the place. He refers to them as the 12 tribes and the dispersion. And he's writing to them, and I agree with you, he's writing to believers that are probably very young in their faith, don't know much, they're making all kinds of mistakes, which we're going to see through the book. You know, he has to talk about how they how they use their tongues, talks about this, talks about that. Um, and so he's, he's writing to Jewish believers, and that makes sense out of the fact that he uses so many Jewish terms in this book. Um, you pointed this out to me. He refers to them as hearers of the word. He refers to them as being in the assembly, and the word is synagogue, the Greek word that is the basis of the word synagogue in chapter two, verse two. He refers in this letter to many Old Testament characters, to Abraham, to Rahab. He uses many, many earthy kinds of descriptions, you know, the land, the rain, the grass that grows and sprouts, which is very reminiscent of the teaching of Jesus him, himself. Yeah. And so all of this adds up in my mind to a very early work uh, very much Jewish influenced, and I agree with you. There's not a hint in here of the circumcision controversy with the Gentile believers. It's as though they don't exist yet, yeah. or, or, or if they do, like you said, they're God fearing um, Gentiles who have essentially become Jews. There's not a hint of the Jerusalem co uh, Council um, issues, and there's definitely not a hint of the collapse of the fall of Jerusalem. And I just want to second what you said there, Marcus. That was a cataclysmic event when, when Titus uh, brings his Roman armies into Jerusalem and destroys the temple, burns it to the ground. Josephus tells us, the, the first century Jewish historian, he tells us that more than, uh, I think it's 100,000 Jews were crucified around the walls of Jerusalem at that time. The place was obliterated. For it not to be mentioned yeah. or alluded to or referenced in any way, well, it'd be like me writing a letter to a bunch of people a couple of years after um, Los Angeles was taken out by an atom bomb and making no reference to the fact that the whole world had changed yeah. for Jews. Well, even, had, even if you had written a letter 50 years before that atom bomb telling everybody 
it's going to come. It's going to happen. It's going to mm-hmm. come. And no one believe you. No one believe you. And then it mm-hmm. comes for you not to write her and write a letter and say, see, <laughs> yeah. I told you. you. <laughs> not one New Testament yeah. letter says that about our Lord. He said this would happen. He said this would right. happen. That proves him. Not a one mentioned it, which makes sense. Now, And that's why a lot of the liberal scholars you referred to want to late date everything, because they want to say that Jesus never foretold the fall of Jerusalem at all. That was just put into his mouth later on. But so anyway, I think that this adds up to us knowing basically who wrote James and knowing that it was written very early and knowing that it was written primarily to a Jewish Christian audience. And and you go ahead and and wrap this up. Yeah, let's. uh, It's interesting that. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Luther didn't like this book because it didn't, it contradicted his new understanding of justification by faith right. alone. And so, so there are people that, that want to set this book aside. There are also people, because they recognize how Jewish this book is and how it contradicts basic Reformed theology, in fact, even the book of Hebrews, which emphasizes too much of the priesthood and sacrifice, I've encountered mm-hmm. non-Catholic Christians that want to say that we don't even need to listen to the book of Hebrews or the book of James because it was written for Jews, not for us. So we don't yeah, listen to that. Well, there are slivers out there, yes. And my point there is if you're in that camp, you're basically denying the work of the Holy Spirit for the last 2,000 years. You're throwing out all the early church fathers and the patristics that quoted from James and recognized the importance of James. And so we're going to continue next week. I think, Ken, we're going to try next week. Really, it's going. To, we hope to take this in short jumps. So mm-hmm. we probably will maybe only look at verses 2 through 4 next week. We might go as far as verse 8, but we're going to look at 1 through 4 at least. But in closing... I want to draw our attention back to uh, the verse that I mentioned that Mm -hmm. I kind of like as maybe the theme, and that is uh, 5.8, in which James says, what's what's he want to do for these people? He wants Mm -hmm. to establish their hearts because the Lord is coming. And Ken, you and I both, when we preached, at least I did, once a year, I always preached a sermon that I can guarantee the Lord's coming in our lifetime. <laughs> if not in the clouds, when we meet him face to face. And that can happen at any time. Mm-hmm. And so the urgency of establishing our hearts, because when it really comes down to it, that's what the Lord's going to look at, is our heart. Because our heart is expressed in how we live our life and what we believe. Mm-hmm. So what is our hearts? And all the things that he's dealing with here is helping hearts turn to Jesus. And so, Ken, I look forward to you and I joining next week, and we'll pick up where we left off. Amen. And, you know, one thing I, one thought I have as we, as we shut this down now is that, is that when I think of what these believers had at that time, you know, reflecting on what we've covered here, the fact that they're pretty much new Christians— and they're out there in the diaspora, they're spread all over the place where there's no established Christianity. And they don't have a New Testament. They don't have any of the letters of Paul. They don't have Hebrews. They don't have the Gospels. They don't have anything, um, how how much they needed to have their hearts established. And it, and, and it makes me think, too, of how much we have now. Yeah. Like, what... What grounds do we have to not have our hearts established when we have all of the teaching now of 2,000 years? And I've got a line of Bibles on my desk here and commentaries, and wow. Yeah. And so we, anyway, so next week we'll be digging into why he wrote it and begin begin to hear that encouragement. All right. Thanks, Ken. And, anyway. and thank all of you for joining us. We look forward to joining you again next week on Deep in Scripture. God bless. We'll see you next Amen. week. Amen. Bye-bye. Deep in Scripture is a production of the Coming Home Network International. To hear more episodes, view our full archive of written and video conversion stories, participate in our online community forum, and more, visit chnetwork.org. You're also invited to explore free membership in the Coming Home Network and receive support on your own Catholic journey. Again, visit chnetwork.org for more information.